It is mid-July 2023 and you are listening to yet another episode of The Future of Photography. The Future of Photography. <clears throat> It's the two of us again, Jeremiah, and I'm Chris. How are you doing there. since last week, Chris? Since last week, we're recording two episodes <laughs> back to back. <laughs> Let me spill the feeds right there. Um, Adrian is on vacation, so uh, we're holding up the fort. And uh, yeah, we want to talk about Remote. photography, about a, di a different kind of photography. I just prior to recording this, we talked about virtually going somewhere and uh, i remember um i have the first oculus quest which now is the meta quest uh and that that had uh, a piece of software you could install called wander w-a-n-d-e-r where you could virtually dip into google street view so you would type in where you want to go and then you'd be there in this spherical panorama kind of thing so you can look around you can move move around as you can in, in street view and while the photography wasn't that high fidelity it was good enough to give you uh, some level of immersion so you could just hop into the rainforest and to uh i don't know to fukushima to mexico to uh stand right outside of Jeremiah's place and wave. Sure. <laughs> um, so so virtually going somewhere um, is, well, is part of the topic today because we want to talk about remote photography. Yeah. In other words, how, how is it possible to create any kind of uh, image, <clears throat> whether it's, whether it's uh, artistic or otherwise? Um, without leaving your house. And, and um, nowadays, with the advent of almost ubiquitous um, uh, internet, uh, IP, um, you know, uh, converted cameras and, and uh, monitors, we, ha we have an opportunity here to, di you know, to dip into all manner of photography, some of which will be familiar to people, but others may not. And... Um, you know, there, there is, of course, cameras all over the world that stream 24-7. And uh, one only has to Google uh, any of these, um, and you can get libraries of cameras that are just focused on a harbor, on a building. The, the classic <laughs> webcams, right? Yeah, they seem mundane often because they're not there to... They're not there to create any kind of dramatic image, but you want to know, is the wind blowing? Are the waves high? Um, you know what I mean? What's the weather? Or just out of curiosity, uh, what's feeding in a water hole in Africa, etc. And you just, you know, you, you dip in and you uh, can become fascinated by these things. But you could also do screen grabs and you could also pull that off and you could also repurpose those and process those. Uh, and it's, it's, it is like wandering, whether virtual or real, around the world. And you can discover all manner of very, very interesting um, potential images that can be lifted directly or, or manipulated. Uh, have you explored streaming cameras? Um, I briefly have years ago um, when I came across some software that would list a lot of them and yeah. uh you could you could yeah hop around in that way i never used them to for actual photography just for information let me see what the i don't know what um trafalgar square in london looks right right, yeah. like right now for example it'd be an interesting kind of contest right <laughs> to, <clears throat> you know the, like the best images created from a streaming remote camera but uh, i re i remember that um Especially during the pandemic, some people switched to remote photography in a different way where you would we'll have there. like a video conference with someone yeah. and you would guide that person on the other side to, to, to move that phone a bit more to the left and yeah. up and so on. There's a, there's a, a, a photo mode in, um, I think in FaceTime, you can actually have 
the camera take full resolution photos remotely. So you could use that to take pictures of something there and you wouldn't, you, you just need to be able to explain to that other person how to compose the photo and where to hold the camera and so on. And then, yeah, it's, it's very p pandemic friendly. It's a remote photo shoot, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, on, um, you know, just moving along uh, the different kinds of things, obviously you go into Google Earth yeah. uh, or Google Maps uh, and you can, again, travel the world, uh, see things that are very interesting, uh, use the kind of the randomness of these cars that are taking these images, passing r random things. And I've, I brought a, uh, a link tree of, of uh, um, an artist who basically uh, posts by uh, the agoraphobic traveler. And um, uh, I, th this particular photographer posts on uh, um, Insta or, or Twitter. Um, has a absolutely, again, spectacular aesthetic. I mean, just magical. Is that him? Street View yes, the Portrait? That, that's yeah. it, yeah. Um, the work here, it, uh, I just think it's... Oh, that is all Google Street View. All Google Street. Wow. And, and it's so good. It's so <clears> amazing. <throat> and um, anyway, this is... Again, a spectacular photographer. I, I call him a photographer because he is taking pictures of this well, or he's, capturing. He's he's the doing images. He's doing archaeology. He 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 digs out the good photos from because there's a lot of well, not photographic <laughs> infinity, material in there. Right, infinity. So you have to you have to be able to to you have to know how to hold the sieve to get the right ones and dump the rest yeah but uh, uh again for anyone interested in kind of you know spending uh a, an afternoon you know you're not feeling well you're in bed and it's like oh, yeah, i don't want to watch tv i don't want to read just start to explore the world and, and pull off images you'll be amazed at how quickly you get sucked down this rabbit hole uh, to find the right aesthetic light and whatnot. And I noticed that he pulls them off and he might, he probably adjusts them somewhat in Photoshop or whatnot. They have a similar kind of color. Coloring yeah, they're, they're, and... de they're not desaturated, but they're very low contrast, harsh sun, but they have their, they have a style. Yeah, they do. And, and that style is not Google's style. That's his style that he either applies or discovers anyway, someone who I love. Um, there's something uh, that, and I, I, did, I apologize, I did not have the time to do a proper um, list of this, but there are public telescopes mm -hmm. that one can actually book time on <clears throat> um, to use those big telescopes to explore if you're a, an astronomer, um, if you're a, you know, not a professional, but... If you're interested in, in space and taking pictures and don't have a telescope or live in light polluted cities like I do, um, that you can actually book a camera on some mountaintop in Chile and um, and have it pointed at a specific at what you want at a certain place. time and capture that uh, in pretty high quality and again um, with a little bit of uh, googling and now maybe some chat GPT <laughs> you could <can> find. <laughs> Uh, a list of those, and those are really quite fun. Uh, and that's another way into remote photography that right. is beyond uh, the scope of building your own <laughs> deep space telescope, which is a little out of our price range. Slightly um, outside, yep. What I always want is if you could take a uh, moderately powerful telescope and point it somewhere on Earth, to get some really compressed. Now, someone like Trevor Paglin, who is, again, on my top 10 uh, artists who work in um, photography and assorted conceptual-based um, image-making processes, um, he, he works a lot with, with um, telescopes, uh, very long lenses, uh, the exploration of the secret sites of the world um and um uh i just again um 
he is someone worth a deep dive into his process, uh, all manner of processes from the highest tech to the most um, simple old school, as you can see here. Yes. But, but his images are absolutely astonishing because they, they, uh, they aren't just the image itself. There is a story behind all of them, whether it's space debris or secret satellites or secret bases. And, and sometimes he'll shoot a, an image, say, in the desert, and the distance is a very <clears throat> heat, heat wave distorted arena, but he will isolate it on a map and say, you can't fly over this, and this is a secret place. So the image itself, informed by the information around it, creates a, uh, uh, an iconic tension. Um, so Trevor Paglin, someone to look at. So, um, but that, but that, of course, brings up some like privacy yeah. and ethical uh, considerations well, as well. Because if you have a, I don't know, a two two thousand millimeter telescope uh, at, on Earth, and you point it at someone's backyard, uh, yeah, or drones, yeah. or drones, drones flying yeah. over here. another yeah. another remote photography, yeah, sure, yeah, um, which you know uh, links to CCTV access. Um, and I know you've talked about this and, and uh, CCTV access, they're generally for security. Some of them you could log in in movies. It seems very easy to hack into all of well, these. Well, there's a, there's a whole bunch of these cameras that might have default passwords and things. And there are, there's entire communities trying to figure those out and find them and list them. So. Um, there are there are cameras looking in some factory that are not supposed to be public but are publicly accessible and people do. Yeah, they're, they're yeah. not. You know, they're they're a cousin of the kind of streaming cameras, but they're generally pointed at a street corner um, or a, you know a, a, a door or something like that. And uh, sometimes they're triggered by motion, sometimes not. But um, if you are able to access some of them, they provide sort of a, a mundane look given together of what is, you know, I, I consider it photography. And uh, one could pull the aesthetic out of it or just study these things to find out how do you compose these to create the right information patterns <clears throat> that are used by the people who are studying the images when needed. So that's a very interesting um, approach to CCTV. Uh, of course, we've talked about this on the show maybe a year ago, like what happens when all of these are 8K cameras and you're floating drones above the city in 8K and basically have a universal high, um, high resolution record uh, going going into the past. Um, and, and I know that there have been some experiments uh, lately with some communities that are hiring a company to do remote viewing over communities in 8K. And so if a crime is committed, they are able to follow the car in reverse. Where did it yes. come from? And uh, within minutes of, say, a bank robbery, just show up at somebody's door and boom, there it is because they followed the car. Now, uh, obviously, that, there's a, that's a double-edged sword, right? Because you're talking about, A, on the one hand, creating, you know... I think uh, there's an entire Freakonomics episode about this. Possibly. Uh, Wouldn't surprise me. Yeah. Anyway, so yeah, it, it, remote photography, there's, there's a whole bunch of that. Uh, so he, here's what I've done. I have, um, I have done a look into the future <sighs> in one year, in five years, and in 10 years. Just a bit of speculation, because that's what we do here on this little show. And uh, so, so one year in the future, I think what we're looking at is just more quality. We're looking at like 5G is getting more persuasive. So we'll have uh, just better better quality because there's more bandwidth. Um, also more more like automatic motion trigger cameras. We've just seen this with the uh, Nikon Z9 with a new firmware, which now includes an AI-based automatic trigger. So you can tell it if, if a person is in this left top quadrant, I suppose this is how it works and then at the right distance, then take that picture. Or 
go and uh, go and and take only pictures of animals like you strap a camera to a tree like a wildlife camera but well, in super high quality yeah, right yeah so that that is one thing that i think was is very near or already there um medium future five years ahead uh, vr integration um just imagine you go on a safari by um, by hiring someone in that country but not going there. But that person <laughs> will carry a, a 3D VR camera for you. So you'll sit on your sofa and you are on the safari seeing all the things as if you were there. Well, that's not, you know, that is easily done today with, with our 360 and streaming. Um, it's not available, though, as a service yet. Not so. yet. But, like, for example, uh, scouting uh, film remotely, uh, sending out a scout. During the pandemic, there was a moment where it looked like I couldn't actually go and scout specific locations. And my local scout, uh, we had worked out a system where he was going to take a 360. I was going to just <clears> get a set of, of those uh, meta goggles at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, and he was just going to stream it to me. And I, I would uh, basically through, you know, on the phone, navigate him left, right, center, move back, move forward, and, and choose the locations based on that. Fortunately, things cleared and I was able to do it personally, but I did do a little bit of a dive into the possibility of doing that today, not in super resolution, but certainly enough to be functional. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and for, for the masses, I think five years is a good time frame for things like that to become... Yeah. available also a thing that i found intriguing is personal satellite photography because we are shooting so many things up into lower earth orbit right now which pretty much probably means that in five years you can get a live video stream from your own house and you can step outside and wave and you can see yourself wave. well funny you should say that uh you know in 90 I think it was 1996, <coughs> 1997. Um, a friend of mine and I uh, explored the possibility of creating uh, small personal satellites, size there of you go. softballs, and uh, and uh, basically having them th literally by astronauts on the spatial thrown out by hand yep. into orbit uh, and connecting that and. Um, we try to raise some money on it. People thought we were crazy. And now, and now you can get a ride share on a on a SpaceX rocket and have your cube set out for, I don't know, a hundred thousand bucks. I don't it's know what the right. costs are, but we are, it's coming down quite. Yeah, we just thought, oh, you could sell thing. this to advertisers. You know what I mean? To yeah, to but just imagine you're a business and you could have a a, a, a real time stream of your, I don't know, you're a farmer and a real time stream of your fields. Sure. Um, that kind of stuff is five years down the road. I'm pretty sure. P personal satellites are coming. Yeah, uh, ten years ahead. That's that's kind of the most far out that I'm daring to look. Yeah. Um, Predictions. Uh, holographic photography, as in advanced AR and and holography technology that will enable 3D imaging that can be projected and viewed like without special equipment. You just go into your holodeck and you are there. Um, yeah, I don't even think, uh, you know, 10 years for that. I mean, if you went for a laser, for example, if you had a laser scanner, very high level yeah. futuristic one, and you just swept a 360 view, you could reconstruct it totally. Oh yeah, this is already happening. This yeah. is already happening. Um, so sooner or later we'll, we'll have that for sure. Um, Space exploration, deep space photography, as remote as it gets. Um, with your iPhone. Well, <laughs> your, with, your, with whatever, whatever with, device you have. With whatever device, um, just you'll be able to virtually go to, I don't know, sit on sit on a James Webb telescope and look around, that kind yeah. of stuff. Of, of course, there is another prediction 10 years ahead that we won't have photography because there'll be nothing left. Everything will <laughs> no. Let's not let's let's not go there. But, but uh, I I think that we will. Uh, you know, if we kind of fuse this with quantum computing, um, and what could be possible, and unlimited energy <coughs> fusion, because uh, I could see that in ten years, uh, which is kind of cheap, free energy, um, and. Uh, 
unlimited kind of quality uh, and, you know, have the same conversations about uh, privacy, personal ownership and ubiquity, uh, both of which will be interesting for artists and uh, governments alike. Um, I think that uh, there'll be things that we, we actually can't even truly imagine what that would be. That's why it's yeah. a speculation part of the show. Sure. Um, and of course, AI will play a bigger and bigger role to the point where I guess you can just send out your AI agent to do the photography for you and it will exactly know what you need and how you what makes you tick and it will bring you back for photos. Yeah, send out a coordinate instead of an address and it will reconstruct the entire it, it'll it'll just dig it out from as as an archaeologist from whatever record is already there and uh, invent the rest and make it. I mean I I think drone photography uh, is going to be very very interesting uh, oh, whether yeah. drone photography becomes high-intensity satellite photography, I don't know, but if you can basically take a snap and then recreate anything uh, in terms of the mapping of that area, even down to a human 360 and the face, uh, these are things that people are working on right now. As right. we talked about a few weeks ago, taking a picture of somebody from behind and having the AI describe what they look like um, and vice versa. Um, very soon, I think as soon as uh, a few months from now, we're going to have the opportunity through Adobe, I think with Gingerbread, uh, to just take a, um, a 2D image and create a 3D asset, which can be used anywhere. Um, <sighs> All right, let's move on to our picks. Um, I brought you one for, well, it, this is, okay, so this is a YouTube video that just uh, recently came out and it features MKBHD and it's uh, shot by Cleo Abram. And they got access to um, to a film production volume, the thing that you these days would use to like shoot the Mandalorian. We've talked about this here with a big LED screen in the back and uh, they kind of compare how this changes the, the, the whole production from like Okay, you used to have green screen, you still do, but that means a lot of post-production to cut it out, to rotoscope things out and to remove the green spill on like reflecting armor, these kind of things. And now with these newer systems, you'll have this LED wall in the back and that will just create, well, it, it will just show a virtual motion tracked image so you can move the camera, you can zoom in and out and the, the, the whole picture in the back will update and look real and uh, um, it's a nice look behind the scenes there and it has a few nice very interesting technical details for example uh, the, the, the system that they look at is they can shoot with four different cameras simultaneously in that volume and each camera sees a different backdrop from a different perspective and the way they do it is that backdrop runs at 120 frames per second. So <laughs> it will, for each of the cameras, show a different picture interweaved in time. So first frame out of the 120 shows camera A, second camera B, camera C, camera D, and then uh, it starts over. And it's so fast that it yeah, that you can shoot four cameras at 30 frames per second or two uh. cameras at 60 frames per second with separate perspectives being rendered there. It's just a technically amazing kind of uh, look behind the scenes. I really enjoyed that. So Yeah, it's 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 basically picking up on uh, you know projected 3D where yes. they just alternate. Um, but yeah, the volume uh, is getting more and more sophisticated as soon as you have the pixel count of these screens reduced even further. Um, then there's no issues with moiré, which is an issue that we face with moiré in terms of right. close, close up. Um, and, uh, and of course, the flexibility, um, though there is something <clears throat> on the screen that just opened in Vegas. They've been promoting that some huge, huge sphere that effectively is a Oh, I've television. seen that. And they're projecting like eyeballs and all kinds of fun there's, things on there's it. There's memes. Like, there's memes out there showing it with a big blue screen of death on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, yeah, something that probably is worth seeing, and uh, it'll be just in time for the F1 rally there. So, um, 
You know, I brought something. I brought a, a, a camera. You brought a camera. Uh, I brought a camera. Uh, speaking of remote photography. A PTZ um, camera. Yes, it looks kind of interesting. This is a total remote camera. Uh, you can pan, tilt, and use very, very, very good uh, lenses on it um, and adjust it as you wish. So this is something I don't think I would leave this out in the forest <laughs> unprotected, but um, it is. Uh, it feels that it's designed for remote photography. Oh, it certainly is, or for remote film production. So. Yeah, I mean, we use, uh, you know, we use heads like this all the time, uh, a slightly bigger, uh, you know, which we'll put on. I don't think we've had a, a, uh, a, you know, a camera operator ride a dolly for at least a year now. It's all remote now. We do it all remote. And um, we're able to, you know, do things where the cameras, of course, um, it, it, it steadies itself. Mm -hmm. um, on the remote head, and uh, this is just a smaller package of that, really. I think that's effective. I think that's that's going to be one of the bigger problems with remote photography. You have such high technology out there, and someone will just walk up and steal it. As in, like the <laughs> Nikon Z9 as a wildlife camera strapped to a tree, um, and then someone just walks oh, past and says, "Oh, that's a nice camera. Let me take that." Yeah, <clears throat> or some moose just. <laughs> or someone eats it. I've seen. I've seen this. Um, sure. What was it? Uh, tiger and someone had a little like RC car with a camera strapped on top of it, with a little PTZ head on it, and the tiger just ate the camera. So <laughs> there you go. You can't have it all. You can't have it all. There you go. Remote there we go. Photography. Remote photography. Um, Prepare for winter. <laughs> Very true. All right, so that was it for this episode of The Future of Photography. I'm wearing the t-shirt today, by the way. See that? Isn't that awesome? So Very you nice. can find us online at thefutureofphotography.com at the usual places. Um, we'll be back soon with more. Until then, everyone, take care. Have a good one and bye-bye. been listening to The Future of Photography. Subscribe to the show wherever you get your other podcasts. Find the show notes and more information at thefutureofphotography.com.